Hello, welcome to our fifth class on marriage and family. And today we're going to be talking about sexuality. So I suspect that this will be very interesting for everyone. Perhaps no other issue other than perhaps money causes so much frustration and anger and uncertainty and frustration, misunderstanding, than the whole topic of sexuality within the marriage. What does the scripture have to say about it? And what does the scripture have to say about what has happened to sexuality because of the fall and man's sin? In Western society, we see a very different picture of sexuality than we do in the scriptures. Every culture has its own view of sexuality, and it would be worth your talking about this within your class among each other for a while, identifying those areas where sexuality has a particular bent, emphasis uh, on it that maybe isn't found in other cultures. Uh, what sin has done to the view of sexuality within the marriage? U.S. and Western civilization has a very broken view of sexuality. In it, people become objects they become a means to each individual's pleasure and self-fulfillment. Women become objects rather than people. And it's, I think, particularly telling in our society that now men have also become objects in the eyes of women. Uh, they're a means to an end. And the end, of course, is our own particular pleasure. There is an emphasis in Western culture on the physical, uh, not the person or the person's character or emotions. It's only an emphasis on outward appearance, on physicality. Sex is seen as an act, not as um, interaction. Uh, it's a one-time stand, a one-night stand. It's viewed very isolated, separated from everything else that a person is. It is very short-term. It is not seen as interaction between people, and certainly not as part of a relationship uh, with all the complications and the complexities that are bound to be there. It's seen as apart from a relationship because a relationship takes time to build. And in our Western view of sexuality, we simply look at it as isolated acts that have nothing to do with anything. It's seen as involved with little to no commitment, uh, no ties. Uh, commitments are seen as messy as too complicated. The emphasis on becomes on performance, on techniques, rather than on building connections. The short-term physical sensations, those are what sexuality is about in Western society. The emphasis is on the sensual, on the physical, on touch rather than on the spiritual, the emotional, the social side of a particular person. Sexuality is hardly ever seen as uh, long-term, but rather just short-term. But the biblical view of sexuality is very, very different. And it begins in Genesis, as does everything else, 
And we could look at, for example, Genesis chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. Uh, it's seen as complicated, as multifaceted. Uh, sexuality is a combination of the physical, the emotional, the social, and the spiritual and the mental. Adam and Eve are not ashamed of their sexuality before the fall, and that speaks volumes to us. Uh, for example, when we see Adam responding, this is now flesh in my flesh and bone of my bone, he's indicating that there's connection there. Uh, there is a uh, relationship there. Uh, it's more than just the physical, but it certainly is the physical as well. Uh, there is a union. There is a oneness. The two became one flesh. Interconnection and interdependence. There's commitment. You see that in the idea of holding fast to each other, cleaving to each other. And there is a great joy in each other. Uh, I suppose that we were to be able to get beneath the uh, Hebrew poetry of verse 23, uh, we would really be able to see the, the joy, the excitement that there is in Adam as he beholds his wife for the very first time. They're naked, they're not ashamed of each other. They're open with each other. Uh, there's no guilt, no fear, no embarrassment. They're simply to enjoy each other. And I think it points out again that sexuality really is a creation of God. It is a part of who we are and who we are made to be. And because it brings great or it can bring great joy, it ought to point us to how good our God is and how much he loves us to give us a gift like this. And so we ought not to be ashamed of it when it's in the right context, the marriage context, and when it's done with a commitment, with a relationship with each other. What does the Hebrew description of sexuality and of intimacy, when it uses the word knowing each other, what does that tell us? Well, I think it tells us a number of things. For example, it tells us of a commitment to time and effort, uh, knowing some other person in their fullness takes time, takes work takes effort. It takes commitment. It's not something that can happen overnight or quickly. It's something that uh, two people work at with each other. Uh, it takes investment in each other. It requires a broad study of each other, knowing the similarities, the differences, the weaknesses, the strengths, knowing the fears, the dis doubts, the disappointments of another person, knowing their interests, their desires, uh, their, uh, their joys. Um, in one sense, every moment is sexual in a marriage. It's interesting that both genders often desire the same things in a, an intimate relationship, but maybe in a different order. For example, for the man, uh, mutual pleasure may be at the very top of his list, uh, a sense of connection, a sense of having a wife who is responding to him, uh, but who also isn't afraid of some initiation. Uh, he's looking for affirmation from his wife. He's looking for respect from his wife. Now, the wife, on the other hand, is looking for affirmation, perhaps, first of all, uh, for connection, uh, for security, uh, for romance. 
So while they're looking for the same things, they may be looking for them in, in different orders, and sometimes that can cause uh, some misunderstanding and some frustration. This is certainly an area where a husband and wife ought to be talking with each other about and ought to be sharing freely with each other without embarrassment, without fear, uh, without uh, holding back as to what they're looking for in the marriage relationship. In uh, Proverbs chapter 15, verses, uh, chapter 5, verses 15 through 21, it presents a very beautiful picture of marriage within the, uh, of uh, sexual intimacy within the marriage context and of the dangers and destruction when sexuality is exercised outside of the marriage bond. There are joys that flow from the commitment, from the years of building this relationship. Uh, it talks about uh, loving the wife of their youth, which gives the idea that perhaps they're not in their youth anymore, but they're continuing to be committed to each other and growing in their knowing each other. Uh, there's a mutual enjoyment of sharing with each other their sexuality and sharing the exclusivity of their relationship with each other. In the Song of Solomon, commentators differ in terms of what they think this is saying. They look at it sometimes as simply the relationship between Christ and the church, uh, sometimes simply the relationship within a marriage, sometimes in uh, sexual intimacy between a husband and wife. Again, if we see sexuality as a part of God's creating us, we have to combine it then with spirituality, with the physical, the mental, the social, the moral aspects of an individual and of two individuals as they come together in the context of marriage. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, Paul talks about the responsibilities that husbands and wives have to each other. And he talks about the responsibility that they have sexually, that they are to share themselves with each other, to not use sexuality as a weapon, uh, withholding it from the other spouse as a way of punishing them or of bargaining with them in order to get something. Sexuality belongs to each other. The husband's body does not belong to him. It belongs to his wife. The same with the wife's body. It belongs to her husband. And so it's to be shared in both of them freely with each other within that context of marriage. Uh, Ephesians 5 as it talks about husband-wife relationships and how they are to mirror the relationship between Christ and his church, certainly has things to say to us about sexuality. Uh, the husband is to love his wife as, Paul says in Ephesians 5, in the same way as Christ loves his wife, at the bride. The connections between them. Uh, reminding us of passages like, I am the vine and you are the branches. Uh, this connection and this deep dependence that the church is to have on her husband, Christ. We're also taken back then to uh, Genesis chapter 1, how God created man in his image, male and female. 
And so in their interrelationship with each other and perhaps at its deepest level in the sexual area, they are to be aware that they are imaging the perfect communication, love, commitment, uh, faithfulness, and on and on that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have for each other. So sexuality and sexual intimacy are to be exercised in the spiritual realm, not separating it from the physical, but to recognize that this is a gift of God and therefore to approach it with great thankfulness. It's also interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, at, in verse 5, that it connects sexuality and the exercise of sexuality with prayer. So you see, sexuality and spirituality cannot be separated from each other. They are intimately connected. This is a subject that we can say a lot about, but hopefully... This sparks some conversation within your class, and hopefully it will also spark conversation between you as leaders uh, in the church and leaders in your family with your spouses. Uh, take this home. Talk with each other. Grow closer together. Grow in knowing each other, and through your relationship, your oneness with each other, Grow in your knowing your God and your oneness with Him as you grow in Christ-likeness. Thank you.